This episode of the MyCom Podcast is brought to you by Educational Opportunities Tours, or EO Tours. They provide journeys of a lifetime. For over 51 years, we've offered standard journeys and customized tours for individuals, churches, and organizations. www.eo.travel or 1-800-247-0017. Last year, we dipped our toes in the water of AI with an excellent primer from Kenny Jang on what generative AI is, some ministry uses, and how to get started. Since then, I've personally used AI tools to help me refine and clarify my thoughts and writing as a brainstorming partner in sermon prep, and I've even generated a few images for sermon series and church events. Then, late last year, I ran across a new AI tool specifically tuned for ministry that seemed to offer many of the benefits AI offers, like saving time and bringing clarity, while also avoiding some of the potential pitfalls, like the AI just making things up. And for those of us specifically doing the work of church communications, this type of AI tool can help us streamline the repurposing of content your church is already generating week in and week out. On this episode of the MyCom Church Marketing Podcast, we're talking about extending the sermon with the help of artificial intelligence. And we have the privilege of welcoming the creator of one of those tools, as well as a UMC pastor who's all in on discovering ways to use tech like this to make disciples. Thank you to everybody for listening. My name is Dan Wunderlich. I'm a United Methodist pastor, and our guests today are Michael Whittle, the founder and CEO of Pulpit AI, as well as Reverend Chad Brooks, a UMC elder who wears many hats from local church pastor to conference congregational vitality strategist to the guy behind the Productive Pastor Extended Universe. Michael and Chad, thank you guys so much for being with us today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Michael, let's start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and ultimately how you ended up founding a ministry-focused AI company? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so to make a long story short, I've um, you know been serving in ministry uh, since I was 16 years old in various capacities, um, both kind of on staff and kind of as a lay leader, lay pastor. Uh, helped plant a church with some of my friends in the city of Los Angeles in 2015. Um, and it just kind of served as in the local church and, you know, as a pastor in various capacities, campus pastor, teaching pastor, executive pastor, uh, kind of you name it. Uh, and then at the same time, have just always been an entrepreneur. So uh, predominantly working in the advertising and media space, really focused mm. on advertising tech, advertising technologies. Um, so built digital advertising networks inside of, you know, taxi cabs in Las Vegas and New York and Singapore and. Oh, wow. Um, black cars in New York City. And so, you know, I've kind of been running these two, you know, these two tracks, um, you know, for, for, uh, you know, over the last decade. Um, and then to make a really long story short, uh, <laughs> I, with, with some friends, uh, started kind of a faith based media company about 18 months ago where I just kind of went to some of my friends and said, hey, let's just kind of create this loosely networked collection of podcasts and newsletters and, um, just kind of put some content out into the world that's kind of our point of view and our tone that we kind of think is maybe lacking across the body of Christ, at least in our, you know, young <laughs> minds. Um, sure. And that all kind of led me to kind of really just take a step back and look at online uh, faith-based content from a macro level. And mm. one of the things that I really began to get a conviction about uh, is that, you know, the local church pastor is really the most prolific content creator we have, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I believe, you know, if you, if you really think about it, right? I mean, if the average pastor spends between 10 and 15 hours a week preparing a sermon, uh, that's more quote unquote content um, than, you know, the vast majority of people. And so I just, I, I, I felt this need in the world of the Christian influencer and the Christian YouTuber to figure out a way to give a digital signal uh, back to the local church pastor. Mm, um, mm-hmm. and I just thought, you know, most local church pastors, you know, we're a medium sized church, uh, in LA, but in LA, a medium sized church is, is really like a small church because of how expensive yeah. everything is. And so yeah. we operated with razor thin margins and small staff. And so I know what it's like to just kind of have be doing a little bit of everything. And, um, so that was kind of how this happened. And then, um, to be honest with you, I came across uh, a piece of technology that, that had been being built for about four years now um, and uploaded 
uh, one of our podcasts to it that was kind of, you know, sort of a deeper theologically nuanced conversation and was just absolutely blown away by um, what it was able to return in terms mm. of, uh, you know, kind of associated content uh, around that conversation. And so I immediately went on the internet digging around to find out who was the person that created this technology and reached out to them. And I said, I think you have something really special. Turns out the guy's a believer. Um, and, uh, uh, so that was kind of the beginnings of this thing called, called pulpit AI. And, and kind of, this was in the middle of right in the middle of kind of that AI hysteria, ChatGPT had just launched. And um, I just thought, you know, what if we could build something specifically tailored to pastors and church communication teams? And so we were honestly building a little product that I thought 25 of my friends would use. And then I made (laughs) the mistake of, I made the mistake of posting about it on Twitter uh, uh, yeah. One Friday, one Friday afternoon, and then the Christian Twitter zeitgeist took a hold of it. And next thing you know, we had you know <laughs> twenty five hundred pastors and church leaders wanting to use this thing. And I'm going, ah, this is it's not ready for that yet. So, um, <laughs> um, that's been yeah. I kind of trip and fell into it, to be really honest with you. Um, yeah. In terms of exactly what the product is and, and all that kind of stuff, and we're still in such early stages of it, but it's been a blast so far. That's awesome. And and I I just want to say I so resonate with what you're talking about because I I probably preach too many sermons a year. You know, I'm mm-hmm. I'm probably 45 to 46 um, you wow. know, a year um and I really should be much lower and 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 yet I feel really guilty. I feel like I'm falling short of some of these pastors who are writing books and putting out studies and they've got a leadership podcast and then you find out they preach maybe 26 times a year. Um and so it's <laughs> like it's not that I'm putting out less content quote unquote than anybody else. It's just it's all right. going into the sermon. And for most churches, unless you're clipping like a reel, which we talked about last summer in the summer of 2023, uh, how to do that and how effective that is in today's world, those oftentimes get delivered once and maybe put on YouTube or a podcast feed and then they're gone. Right. And you all of that content is just like it's hopefully, you know, buried in the heart and soul of of your of your church and transforming them into disciples. But um what I love about this tool and what AI in general can do is it can help us uh, extend the sermon. Um, and so, yeah. and, and in full disclosure, I am one of the early users uh, of, of pulpit AI and, and I've really enjoyed it and we'll talk about it later. But um, one of the people who stumbled upon it and seems to be uh, pushing it to its limit is our other guest, uh, Chad Brooks, Chad, you and I have known each other digitally for a very long time. We still got to meet up in person yeah. sometime, but um, we are uh, some of the earlier UMC podcasters. Um, you know, I, there, I'm sure yeah. there are people who started earlier than us, but I started my art of the sermon podcast back in 2015, which is basically like right after serial. Um, and your first iteration of productive pastor was already underway at that point. Uh, can you give us a thumbnail sketch as to what you're up to today? And uh, I'd specifically love to hear about your local church ministry and its context, because I think some people may be surprised the kind of, um, setting you serve in. Yeah. So I spent nine years as a church planner, uh, had a beautiful ministry at a church in North Louisiana, and it was full of young people and exciting things. And we had the absolute uh, complete freedom to really push the edge of social media and communication and what that means in a, a normal size local church. Um and it was funny was because, you know, in the deep South, you have giant churches everywhere. You can kind of throw a rock and hit them. And uh, yeah. people would come to us on Sunday morning and be astounded because, you know, they saw our media and assumed we were, you know, a church of you know, six or seven hundred in a, a slick facility. And they, we were in a high school gym or a 40 year old church gym. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and that was a, and, and honestly, that was sometimes a funny thing, sometimes a good thing, and then sometimes not a good thing. Sure. Um, just that, that made me begin thinking about the honesty of, you know, who we say we are as a church and, you know, what we use resources for and everything. So, but I transitioned a year and a half ago uh, into extension ministry, which in Methodist language is uh, uh, keeping my ministry credentials, but not necessarily working full time in the local church. 
And uh, so I serve now as the Congregational Vitality Strategist for the Louisiana Conference. And so I'm over uh, planting and replanting and church revitalization and all those things officially. And then unofficially, I'm kind of one of the people that folks turn to about, you know, uh, technological solutions, especially when it comes to media and communications. Um, uh, we have a fantastic communicator, Todd Rossnagel. You might have met him before, Dan. Yes. Yep. He's um, been on our podcast. He takes care of a lot. Yeah. So Todd's a good friend of mine. He takes care of a lot of stuff. But me, and um, I just kind of experiment. That's what I like to do is I like to experiment. Um, and then I serve as a extremely part-time pastor of a rural congregation of around uh, 16 people on Sunday morning. Uh, and part of my struggle asking those questions, um, when I saw Pulpit AI, I realized, um, you know, how do you disciple people that live 35 to 40 minutes away from you? Yeah. But are extremely committed on Sunday morning. Um, and this church had never had a digital presence whatsoever at all. I saw the tool and thought, let's try this experiment and see how it works. And it began working really, really well. And so that's kind of my context now is, you know, working at, at, at a denominational level with churches, but then also, you know, serving an extremely small rural church that a lot of pastors do that are squeezed for time and budget. Absolutely. And that describes a fair amount of, of our audience. This is a, um, a podcast that reaches a lot of small churches, and I know both of you have a heart for resourcing um, the small church. Uh, Chad, I, I love your humility. Um, we're recording this well before it goes out, but the other day on, on Twitter, way back in the past, um, you were like, hey, I resource small churches. If you're a larger church, here's who I send people to. Um, and, it, and it takes mm-hmm. both a humility to say that, but it also reveals your heart for the small church. Um, and, and, and I just so appreciate both of you for, for having that kind of love and, and passion. And, and Michael, like you said, what might be a small church in Florida is a medium church in LA. Um, can you talk to us about your, your, your heart and your passion for a small group of people who are uh, committed to the church? Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, you know, as a, as a church planter, in Los Angeles, you know, <clears throat> you experience a lot. I think I think a lot of this really came from my experience probably during COVID, if I'm being yeah. super honest. You know, my wife and I led um, our, our church at four locations across the city mm. of LA. And, and my wife and I led our, our largest one kind of in the coolest, hippest part of Los Angeles, right? We yeah. were meeting in like nightclubs. I mean, our Easter service in 2019, there had been a 420 weed smoking party in the venue the night before, <laughs> right? So we're talking two blocks off Skid Row, you know, yeah. and, and in my like young entrepreneurial ministry mind, we were killing it, you know, we were mm-hmm. growing and, and people all over the city knew who we were and uh, we could activate you know, young adults into being at church, serving in church, going to small groups, you you know, all that kind of stuff. And then COVID hits and, you know, uh, six to eight weeks into COVID, all of these amazing church members we had built all of a sudden started deconstructing their faith and not believing in the gospel anymore. And and I think for me, I was like, man, I've been pastoring. I I, I thought I'd been pastoring these people (laughs) for, for a long period of time, but maybe I was just producing an event that I could get them to every week. And so mm. my ministry context changed and I just went, man, you know, and, and maybe this was me, you know, growing up a bit, you know, and kind of, and you know, having a, a kid and, and sort of maybe leaning more into that like pastoral heart, but just going, man, we have a generation of young people who desperately need discipleship and they desperately need um, to be pastored and not just led. And I think there's a really yeah. strong difference, you know, in that. And so to me, man, I just, you know, I've been reading a lot of Eugene Peterson and I just got into this yeah. place of like walking with people and discipling them and just helping them, uh, you know, like follow Jesus well. And that may sound like a very simple change, but for me, it was, it was wild. And so our church has just completely moved in a totally different direction in terms of the way yeah. of how we build church and what we focus on. And we've just seen the fruit from it. Now the growth has been slower and, you know, it's not as flashy as it was and, and we're not doing all the all the stuff that you're supposed to do to have a cool growing church in an urban area, but we're actually seeing people's <laughs> lives changed. And yeah. so I don't know, I guess, I guess for lack of a better term, I just, my ministry philosophy has so changed <laughs> over the last yeah. two or three years 
that when this pulpit AI thing came up, it was like, oh, wow, this is, this is maybe how I can play a role in, in kind of helping, um, move this, this ball forward, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll say, and, and I'm sure Chad has heard all the stories because I know a lot of his work is is sitting with pastors who are still trying to process 2020 through, you know, last week. Um, it, it's, it's not just young people who realized they weren't actually mm. disciples, you know, and, and it was either a <laughs> habit or a club or, you know, um, in, in I'm, I'm in Florida and the United Methodist Church was one of the last churches in our area to reopen. Uh, and so by the time we reopened, everyone's schedule was full again. You know, it's not just other churches were open, like youth sports were back and the golf course was open again. And, and, you know, suddenly people were booked on Sunday morning, but, um, let's, let's, let's look to the future. Let's encourage ourselves. So, um, as I mentioned in, in the intro, when I got started, uh, experimenting with AI tools last year, it was largely, um, for help on the front end of stuff, brainstorming, clarifying ideas, proofreading, stuff like that. Um, and where we saw a lot of the discussions online related to AI and sermon specifically, it had to do whether it was even okay to use AI in sermon prep or not. Um, you know, there'd be the news story about the pastor who delivered a fully written AI sermon as an experiment. There would be the pastors who said they tried chat GPT and all it generated was fake quotes and Bible verses that aren't actually in the Bible. And then there were some who see AI as, you know, essentially the mark of the beast. But Michael, what you are doing very intentionally does not come on the front end, but rather on the back end. So instead of helping to craft a sermon and thereby potentially inserting less than quality ideas or content, it takes a sermon that hopefully we have already crafted to be theologically sound, uh, and it repurposes it into a suite of resources. Um, what inspired this approach, maybe for your your colleague that designed the tool, or, or what made you see that tool that does the work on the back end? Why was it so valuable for you as a ministry tool? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, <clears throat> you know, I, I I am a big believer in the voice of the local church pastor and anything that we can do. And I also see the other things that pastors have to deal with all throughout yeah. the week, right? And so when I sort of came into this, when I sort of saw how uh, this, it, it's a, it's a neural network. So it's, you know, it's, it's basically what pulpit AI is built around and, and, you know, in full disclosure, and I've said this before, we, we do pull and we do hit the open AI API, but we do it after yeah. the audio has been uploaded, processed through and transcribed through our neural network. And then it then pings open AI and then pings back to our neural network. And so essentially what it's able to do is it's able to perform very specific, like, conversational natural language and it understands tasks at a really high level of performance and what's possible with even GPT-4 at about a one one hundredth of the cost, right? Mm. And so what I was super interested in is, um, hey, this is extracting whole thoughts and whole ideas. It's not adding a bunch of color. Mm. It's keeping, and, and it's actually kind of doing a really good job of understanding some of these theologically nuanced, um, you know, ideas. And so when I saw that and I thought, man, the amount of pastors that I know that have archives of hundreds and thousands of sermons, um, yeah. that, that people need. So I think it was sort of that. And then I think on a very personal perspective, you know, a week didn't go by where I wasn't talking to one of the people in our church about some random podcast episode that they'd heard and their theology had just mm. gone in this really, frankly, weird direction. And I was like having these discipleship <laughs> conversations with these people. And I'm like, yeah, I know that this dude has 100,000 followers on YouTube and calls himself a theologian, but like what, you, you know, so I think it was just this mixture of like, man, like what if we really could help pastors repurpose their content? And then also, mm. honestly... I just went to, into the next room in our church building where I was working from and I found the, our staff member, her name's Sarah. She's our groups director, our youth director. She runs our comms and she runs our social media. And I said, hey, send me one of uh, Jake's sermons and let's upload it and let's just see kind of what it spits out. And so we did. And she was like, Michael, this would save me eight to 10 hours a week. And, um, mm. and it sounds more like Jake than when I just sort of figure out a way to hack GPT, chat GPT and use it that way. And so uh, that was the moment where I said, okay, so like one person thinks this is helpful. Let's try it with five or six more and see. And so that was just kind of the, the snowball. 
Um, and when I started hearing people say, this is going to save us a lot of time, uh, and this for the most part properly reflects what it was that I was trying or what it was that I was saying in my sermon, I thought, okay, this is, this could be something special uh, and really helpful. Yeah. And I, and I, and I really appreciate that. And, and, and I'll, you know, I'll note that there are, there are some other tools that are similar to pulpit AI that are being developed and, and, and we can use, you know, like a free version of chat GPT to do similar things. Uh, but I, I do appreciate the, the tuning that you all have done, um, whether it's, uh, you know, without giving away the secret sauce, I don't know whether it's just you guys have excellent prompts on the back end or that neural network that I don't fully understand, but it really does seem to understand what a church might need throughout the week. There's, there's, um, your specific tool has sort of baked in resources like discussion questions and devotionals and things. Uh, but it also has that, that conversational quality to it. Um, ha- like how much, how much work do you all have to do to kind of shape it for ministry? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, I, quite honestly, I would love to have, uh, our, our developers on who can yeah, kind of even sure. more dive deeper into to some of that. But, you know, the beautiful thing about these neural networks is uh, they train on data and, and audio. It was specifically trained on about a half a million hours of podcast listener mm. data mm-hmm. and audio. And then it, it trains against itself, you know, and, and it trains with itself. And so once you sort of set up all the parameters, um, you know, it, 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 it naturally does its thing. Now we have plans and I think, you know, without, like you said, I don't want this to become, let me sell pulpit AI to you, but we're, right. we're on, you know, we're on the two yard line and we still got 98 yards to go mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the ministry specificity that we believe this tool is going to, um, you know, really, really move towards. And so when I hear like, you know, hearing Chad say a few months ago, like, man, the quality of, between this and chat GPT is wildly different. I'm just sort of going like, okay, that's what I thought people would say, but I'm glad to to actually hear it. So <laughs> yeah, most of it is done, yeah. is just done naturally once the technology is built and um, maintained and tuned. And then, yeah, some of it is prompting um, as well. And that's kind of uh, what we, what we really do put a lot of focus in. Um, and, and so again, we're still figuring out how exactly to continue to maneuver that more towards ministry and are talking about, you know, different denominations and different theological bents. And what does it look like to be able to click a button and, you know, your sort of United Methodist theological tenants are taken into consideration, uh, when spitting out, uh, content, like those are all the things that we're thinking about. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, for us, we're more focused on that than we are features, if, if that makes sense. Because oh, I think that if, 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 if we're just building features, then I think, you know, um, it's, it's going to be a race to – Right. We don't need to go down that road. But but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. Yeah, it's just a race to what's the shiniest new update. Um but no, I exactly. I appreciate that. And that was kind of one of my one of my questions and and we can just say that like it's something that you all are working on is, you know, obviously anytime you are are asking, you know, artificial intelligence to analyze something and to even to a degree, I mean it creates stuff. Like it, you know, it writes summaries, it writes discussion questions, and it's not just clipping a sentence and putting a question mark at the end from your sermon. It really is trying to understand your sermon and write discussion questions, especially at, I would say, especially right now in the United Methodist Church, um, we are now. Uh, this will come out in early 2024. The UMC is in a time of transition, in a time of trying to reclaim our unique identity and rally around who we are as Wesleyans. I, I guess maybe some some of some of us may be concerned that like, am I going to put this in and get back a Baptist study guide? Uh, and this is maybe where we can turn to you, Chad. You've been one of the early adopters of Michael's uh, tool, and you have been experimenting with it for a while. Um, can you talk to us about what you have seen from um, maybe AI in general, what tools you've used, and then when you use a ministry-specific tool like Pulpit AI, um, what... Uh, what have been like the strengths and maybe what are some of the things um, you would, you would caution us to look out for as we um, generate these types of resources? Yeah. So I, the, the, when I saw pulpit AI, the reason I got excited was 
I was already just trying to think through this question of, you know, how can I be active in discipleship in, you know, in a local church that I live, you know, 35 minutes away from, uh, and United Methodist language is a quarter time appointment. Um, it's been a quarter time appointment for 30 years. So, mm. you know, they've, they've not, they've, they've not had a pastor who's lived in their community for, you know, over, I think 15 years, My goodness. um, uh, that sort of a piece. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's a, a community of 1500 people. I mean, just, it's, it's so far different removed from what ministry has been like for me for the previous 20 years since I've been getting a paycheck from a church. Um, yeah. And, and so I was thinking about this, and when I was at my, my previous church, we had we had done something I called the home sheet. If folks follow me online, they've heard me talk about the home sheet before. Uh, and it was a great strategy we had where we kind of went in and did. I mean, this is this is before uh, GPT got released. We started doing this in 2019, uh, and you know I did it as long as I was at that church till uh, 2022, and uh, we found it be very eff- effective. And it was simply an idea of. Um, a handful of reflection questions for the week, a handful of discipleship actions, all based off of the sermon. Um, and I was, you know, generating those throughout the week as I was preparing for the sermon. And, and honestly, I felt I found myself in that time just falling into the same kind of rote things. Mm. Uh, but I, I figured that was going to be something that could potentially work in this scenario. But I knew that, you know, it also I started doing so. I talk about church growth a lot and church size culture. And, you know, yeah. I know that you know, I see 16 to 22, 23 people a Sunday at my little church, but I know I have 45 active adults. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this community is, this community loves their RVs and <laughs> it's nothing for them to, you know, to drag a trailer from losing it to Talladega for the weekend, sure. that sort of a thing. Um, and so I was like, okay, this might happen. Uh, so I, we're going to have to start podcasting though, in order to make this happen. Um, yeah. which this church, had, I mean, this church didn't have a Facebook page when I started working there. Um, but I, I was curious. I was like, let me see what this looks like. And, and, and so I knew I had a road wireless go, I guess this is the kind of, the, I have a Twitter thread that took off about this. Um, and, uh, Dan, I'll give you the link when it's done. Cause it's not, I think it's coming out this week, but this podcast is coming out into the future. Um, yeah. You know, Patrick Miller and the whole Truth Over Tribe folks have another website called mm-hmm. Endeavor that I actually wrote an article for them detailing them this process of what I do. Uh, and so I realized my Rode Wireless Go, my video microphone, uh, is an internal hard disk recorder. And so I uh, recorded my sermon one Sunday. I paid a machine transcription service. I, nine cents a minute, I guess. Yeah. yeah to transcribe yeah. it into a transcription. Um, and this was after GPT had come out uh, and I was just using the free version. And uh, the transcription was like 60% there uh, between my redneck and I have a little <laughs> bit of a stutter. Uh, it got yeah. like 60% there. Um, yeah. But I took the janky transcription, dumped it into chat GPT, and started trying to ask it questions. And it, it kind of did an all right job, but it was very generic. And I did find a little bit of, there was just no theological nuance to it whatsoever yeah. at all. Um, but I was like, okay, in theory, I could do this, but it, it's not, the output is not good enough for me to trust it. Mm. Um, but I was also experimenting, like, you know, uploading podcast episodes with productive pastor and other stuff I do. And it was like, I really wish this could work better because this could be really cool, but this is just too janky. And I saw there was podcast people out there doing it. Um, and other ways I was like, ah, I'm just not that much into this. Well, I saw Michael start talking about this cause I actually found Michael through some of their other podcasts mm. and was already following him on Twitter. So I, I was surprised that people- didn't completely. Chad, I'm surprised that didn't completely just make you block me never to never to speak to me again <laughs> after hearing some of our podcasts. <laughs> no, no. I listened to the one with Travis uh, from that works with John Tyson at Church of the City. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's how I found John. I was like, okay, I'm going to keep up with these cats because they're doing – they're asking a lot of the same questions I was. Um, uh, and, 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 and so that happened – Got that in, saw the tweet. I'm like, you know what? This looks interesting. I want to give this a shot and to try it. 
and um, was one of the the first users to get through. I think I think I actually sent Michael an MP3, and he sent me outputs first. Um, and at that point in time, my church wasn't podcasting, so I gave him one of my old sermons, uh, a sermon that I was like, okay, this is a good sermon, like this is, but it's all it was on Song of Songs, and it was like the second sermon in a series. It, it was a complicated sermon. Yeah. Uh, and I did the exact same thing. I, I ran the, through the, the, the machine transcription service I was paying nine, nine cents a minute for, fed into chat GPT, tried to get it to do some things, and then got Michael's outputs and was blown away. I was like, these are radically different. Mm. Um, just radically different. Um, and it, it, it blew my mind in how the, the, the pulpit AI, it knows it's a sermon. Yeah, and the early yeah. beta version, you still see the word "episode" show up right. in some of the the transcription stuff. Um, uh, but that was it. So the second thing about the whole, I'm worried I'm going to get a Baptist study God out of it. Yeah, You're, it does what you do, right? So if you, I mean, it, it's it's going to play off what you're inputting, and uh, that that's what that, I think that's the thing that people still can understand. I love how Michael will share share things on Twitter sometimes about this. If people don't understand, this only works with what you give it. Yeah. Um. And and, and so that that functions there. Uh, and so I I feel like it's a tool that if you understand what you can do with it, you can do a significant amount of things with it. I think that a lot Absolutely. of the concerns that people might have is just not understanding what they're getting into. Absolutely. And and I would uh, encourage folks to go to Pulpit AI's YouTube channel uh, and dig back into 2023. Michael and, and Chad did a, a video chat and, and walk through Chad's process. And I'm sure by the time this podcast drops, um, Chad's process will have evolved and and you can reach out to him to see what he's doing now. But uh, they give a pretty good walkthrough. And, and it seems too, from following you all back and forth on Twitter, uh, Chad, you're finding unique ways to kind of stretch the system and ask it to put out yeah. things that um, aren't naturally baked in. But yeah. as, as we... Um, as we draw to a close, this is a church marketing podcast, a communications podcast. And so we do want to speak directly. Um, you know, the interesting thing, a, a fair amount of our audience are actually local pastors because there are a lot of local pastors who are more than just the pastor. They're the pastor and the comms person and the janitor, you know, all, all things at once. Um, but let's say that you are someone whose job is communications and you obviously are working for the mission of discipleship. Uh, that's got to be the heart of what we're all doing. Um, but maybe things like creating devotionals or distributing discussion questions that might fall in someone else's sphere of responsibility. Um, Michael, how might a tool like pulpit AI or something similar be helpful to the person whose job it is to keep the social feeds or the email inbox flowing with content? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> look, I think it, um, I, I think it can be really helpful in a sense of, um, you know, really it, it helps you get past the blank page, you know, um, in yes. a lot of ways, I think that, I, I think that, that that's a huge, I mean, you know, it was, it was cool. Like really on really early on in the middle of this, someone reached out to me and said, it's so funny. My job is to during the second service, you know, listen to the first service of the message and timestamp it and pull the quotes <laughs> yeah. from it. And, you know, so I think it's like, it's, I think it's speed and it's value add, you know? And I think that's yeah. the really cool thing here is like, even when it comes to, your social media, right? Like it's so easy to just post a social media and treat our Instagram church pages as a bulletin board to let the church know what's coming up. And, and, and that's all great. But I think yeah. what this gives you the ability, the ability to do is, is really depending on how, um, how, uh, precious you are about your words, it can get you anywhere from 15% of the way there to, you know, 80 or 90% of the way there, uh, with really value add, um, uh, content that really gives people the opportunity to interact with it. I think another thing, you know, that we're thinking a lot through without kind of giving away in terms of what we're thinking about, about the future of, of, of the product is not just content creation, but also content distribution. You know, mm -hmm. how are you able to distribute uh, and then, you know, track, Hey, okay, we're sending these devotionals to our church. Um, could we do that through text messaging? Could we do that through email? How could we interact and make that a more of a back and forth 
uh, type conversation. So I think what it does is it just creates a, um, a high touch, uh, piece of content. That's not necessarily just marketing, but that's, that's more kind of interactive and, and, and helps people think deeply. So to me, I think it's a time saver. Um, you know, look, I think, like I said, you know, a, a lot of these AI tools, uh, and, and even the ones that are all serving the body of Christ, which like, like you mentioned, there are a few others that are great and, and I've met the folks run, you know, building those. And I think we're all the cool thing. The beauty about that is some of us, all of us are so aligned on wanting to help the local church, um, yeah. which has been so, so cool. So I, I think. It, it, it's ultimately going to come to, okay, we can repurpose content, but then what are we doing with that? How are we getting that to our people? And so I think, you know, if step one is we can help you save time, um, then, then we're, you know, we, we think that that's kind of the, the easiest way to dip your toe uh, in the water. So whether that's social posts or blog posts or emails or w- whatever that might be, um, it, it really is a massive time saver and really just gets you kind of beyond that blank page. And, you know, we really say it's AI generated human perfected. So please, please, please read through everything yes. uh, yeah. that pulpit AI gives back to you. Um, and, you know, make it, make it your, you know, more, more your voice. So I don't know if that answers your question. I, I think um, ultimately what we found is it is just, a, it's a massive time saver and it unlocks things that people weren't able to do before. You know, yes, ab- um, yeah, absolutely. In, in, so, yeah, yeah. Social media Dan, these gonna, days. I want to jump it, in and share. Yeah, go ahead, Chad. I was going to speak specifically to this time saver piece, and this is like super United Methodist. But I was in my <laughs> office a few weeks back in Baton Rouge, and one of our administrative assistants, Kyle, who's amazing, had been tasked with listening to every single word of the business session and the reports from our annual, our annual conference meeting and had been working for two and a half months on oh, transcribing man. these by, because she, they looked at, they looked at AI and it's, it's too expensive and they had one 30 minute report left. And I said, send me the YouTube video and don't start till tomorrow. I pulled the audio down, uploaded it into pulpit AI, got the transcription back. She, just to be careful, read the transcription as she was listening to the video. And there is a pulpit AI transcription with no edits that's in our conference journal next year because it was 98% there. Um, The thing I'll probably start talking about a lot online lately is just the transcription service is so good and is a lot years beyond what you could normally pay for for AI-based transcription. Yeah. Can I, that, thanks, Chad. You're, Chad, is, I promise for anyone that's listening, we don't pay Chad anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> Chad is, man, he's been a, literally a massive blessing. I, I think, so another thing that we're thinking a lot about in terms of that church comms marketing, oftentimes, you know, we're in this rat race of Sunday to Sunday. You know, okay, we did Sunday. What's the content follow up? How are we going to like make that content last throughout the week? One thing we're really interested now is like, man, how about that, that sermon series your pastor preached eight months ago um, about whatever the topic is and how does that relate to something going on in culture right now? And so it's almost the the other thing too, is like all of a sudden the sermon library uh, becomes something that can be repurposed for value add content and not just, you know, Hey, we're, you know, we're heading into Advent, um, or Easter. Okay. Well, what's, what was that sermon series we did last year and how can we create something weeks in advance to, um, you know, walk alongside, have have our church walk alongside with us, you know, during the season. So I think that's the other thing too, is hopefully it gets people off the week to week rat race of kind of just the hamster wheel of service, making the rest of church happen and back to Sunday again. Uh, specifically in the com- comms and, and marketing space, it, it kind of feels like there's there's never a break. So I think that's another thing that it opens up is um, like a wider breadth of content opportunities. Absolutely. And what I appreciate about it is is it helps me find evergreen content. You know, um, mm-hmm. the reel that we put up, you know, in the days following the sermon is usually trying to be sort of the heart of that that particular sermon. Um, but if you can identify another 90 second clip from the sermon that can stand alone, then you've got, you know, a reel ready to go on the week that all you did was 
you know, sing hymns because the preacher was sick or, you know, something like that. Like you have a backlog of content. Um, and, and to sort of, um, to mention another, uh, tech thing that's in beta, I'm a huge fan of the Bible project and they have, uh, mm-hmm. they teach classes through their classroom model. Well, they are making their classroom engine available to churches at learn.bible. Um, and you can create your own classes. It's a, it's basically, it's an online learning platform. Um, and it's, and it's completely free and you can use something like pulpit AI to take a series and turn it in you know, find out what chunks stand on their own um, and what discussion questions can I ask about this chunk? Like it can help you write a class and then you can take another free tool like learn.bible and suddenly, you know, your sermon series, it might not end up, you know, uh, a published, you know, book study from Abington or the United Methodist Publishing House, but it becomes a resource you can point people to. Um, and just being able to stack these things on top of one another, um, it just extends like, like we like we've said this whole time, like we are creating a massive amount of, of, um, content that has the ability and content is such a, such a bad word for what we're doing, but y- y- we all know what we're talking about. Um, it just has the potential to live on and, um, tools like this are, mm-hmm. are so powerful. And so, um, let's kind of close by asking for some words of encouragement. You know, our, our, our folks, our listeners, they're, they're staff people, they're volunteers, they're pastors wearing many hats. Um, they are people who, um, it's, it's a day in and day out work and, and, um, sometimes it's overlooked and often underappreciated. Um, so maybe can you both, uh, number one, can you share how to connect with you guys, how to follow your work and reach out if folks have questions, but then secondly, just, are there any words of encouragement you'd like to leave with our audience today? Man, first of all, yeah, thanks for <clears throat> thanks for having me on to to chat. I I, I think you know, with the risk of uh, at, at sounding cliche, I just think it's like, man, the the work that you're doing is so absolutely valuable and important, and it's oftentimes I know the feeling of juggling so many different things, but it's it is holy, you know, it's a holy calling, and it is something that. We don't know. I'm convinced as someone who's 37 years old and so young and and still has so much to learn, I'm convinced we don't even see the fruit of this work that we do for for decades and decades. And so I think it's like, especially in this time of the year where everyone's so busy and there's so much going on, it's like, man, just that one, like that one person who we know we've encouraged or that one person who reads that piece of content or that one person that sees the photo that you posted from church last Sunday and it makes them feel a little bit more comfortable to come try the church out the next week. It's like, we just, we don't see the fruit um, immediately and that can be discouraging, but I I really, really um, just want to encourage you to to keep going. And there are so many people across the body of Christ that that need you. Um, And so, man, just as a, as a new dad of two kids, who's, raising his family in church when my family didn't raise me in mm. church. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, it is such a needed holy thing. And so, you know, I guess I would just say I'm grateful for you and, um, for the people that are, are building churches, man, it's, it's yeah. not an easy job at all. <laughs> um, Absolutely. but, but yeah, yeah, that, that, that would be can... the only encouragement I have. Oh there yeah. You and you can find where me, can... you know, we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're pulpitai.com. Um, if you know who owns pulpit.ai and can convince them to sell it to us for much <laughs> less than they're trying to sell it to us for, that would be amazing. No, uh, pulpitai.com. I'm on Twitter, Instagram at Michael Whittle. Um, and we're pulpit.ai, I believe, on Twitter. Um, gotcha. And so gotcha. that's where you can find us. All right. Chad, words of encouragement. Yeah, so so this is what I would I would say it is is that you know regardless of 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 what you think is possible in your ministry situation, I think to do ministry in public and to to look at how regardless of what size of church you're at or or what you feel your influence that sort of thing it is you know do ministry in public. Um. Mm. You know, there there are things that used to cost exorbitant amounts of money and take way and, and take way too much time to do. That that's not the case anymore. Um, do ministry in public. You know, share your teaching, share your message. Just, I mean, be, I mean, be a full disclosure person with you know what God's doing in your ministry, what God's doing in your own heart. Because um, you know, I firmly believe that that sometimes is the mustard seed that gets planted. And uh, yeah, 
I've got a, a funny little story about my own little, you know, podcast pulpit AI stack that I do right now. Um, about three or four weeks into it, uh, I trained Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I was in the middle of a sparring session with somebody. And I mean, we're like three and a half minutes into, you know, trying to choke each other out. <laughs> and the guy says, I've been listening to your sermons and doing the devotions. Oh, wow. And I'm laughing because I'm like, this A, not the right time to have this conversation. <laughs> but B, it's Instagram stories. Like at that point in time, I, I don't think I'd even made like anything like public public. Um, I was sharing the podcast feed on Instagram stories, which is linked to Facebook stories. And this guy found it, clicked it, clicked through the show notes then clicked into the devotion through the show notes. I mean, multiple mm. points of engagement. That's, that's terrible. Church we now have this running. Con- <laughs> oh, it's terrible. But I mean, but like <laughs> about you, it was kind of, I was, I was like, I want to experiment and see how this works before yes. I go crazy. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and you can find me on all socials at Rev Chad Brooks, but I'm very strategic with what I do, what, where, and like, I'm, you know, for me, Facebook is just entirely personal 95% of the time. Uh, that's kind of one of the lines I'm drawn around it. So, uh, you know, he literally had clicked through it multiple times and we've got this great running conversation right now. And it's normally like, I'll see him on like a Wednesday or Thursday. He's like, dude, today's devotion just rocked to me. And in my mind, I'm like, I can't even remember what today was. Um, and so it's like, so don't think that, you know, you doing your ministry in public and sharing, um, there are eternal consequences in a positive way of what mm. that might happen. Um, you know, John Wesley said the world is our parish and yeah. our world is a lot bigger right now. But what I love about, you know, what Michael and pulpit have vision is this isn't about you as a local church pastor becoming viral. This is about you as a local church pastor, having more influence amongst the people that you can touch in a real life incarnational way. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I, I would encourage just, you know, do your ministry in public and use the tools that you have in order to do that. Yeah. Well, Michael and Chad, thank you both for being here today. We really appreciate it. Dan, Thanks, thank Dan. you so much for having having us. And now, listeners, we want to hear from you. What AI tools have you begun to incorporate into your ministry work? Have you found any creative ways to make our work more effective or even just a bit easier? And as always, the easiest way to support the show and help other church communicators like yourself find it is by sharing this episode with your friends and colleagues or by leaving a review on whatever service you're listening to us on right now. And did you know that United Methodist Communications has celebrated over 80 years of ministry? Your support ensures that the latest denominational news, dynamic stories, and informative articles will continue to connect our global community. You can make a tax-deductible donation today at resourceumc.org slash giveumcom. Thanks again for listening to the MyCom Church Marketing Podcast. Educational Opportunities Tours, or EO Tours, is a Christian travel ministry that has been delivering Christian journeys of a lifetime for over 51 years. EO's travel experts and on-site hospitality staff handle travel details and ensure safety and health throughout each journey. This, along with curated itineraries, educational resources, and guest speakers, create unique experiences that help develop discipleship, change individual lives, ministry, and the church. www.eo.travel or 1-800-247-0017. Thank you.